Okay, looks like we're live. Uh, let me know when you join. Oh, <laughs> looks like Dave is here already. Good to see you, Dave. How are you? Uh, we'll just wait a few minutes. Just uh, let everybody roll in. As you guys come in, just let me know if you're here. Looks like it's just David so far. Just like every other stream, we'll just wait one or two more minutes. Uh, the stream obviously goes up on our website, so you don't have to be here. The lesson will go on anyway. But I like to wait just so that the people who do watch it live get to watch it live. Okay, so I guess we'll just start now. So for this week, well, in this lesson, uh, we're going to be talking about builds, making builds, how to get other people to play your game. Um, as Natalie said last week, and I will reiterate right now, the build is due May 4th. That is next Monday, I believe. Uh, oh, Saturday. Okay. No, wait. That's April. Okay, yeah, it is Monday. So it's due on Monday. Okay. <laughs> Hi, Narelle. How are you? So the builds, as I said, they do May 4th. That's Monday. Uh, Natalie's going to be playing her games like she usually does. Um, so today we're going to talk about how to make your builds. And in particular, I'm going to show you how to make two different types of builds. One is called a WebGL build. And then one is just a regular build, like an application you could play on your uh, desktop. But for submitting your game, we want you to do a WebGL build. Because what a WebGL build is, it basically just allows you to play the game through a browser instead of having you to actually download the entire application. Yeah, that's fine. Uh, so, uh, Norel says in the chat, uh, that's not happening for me. Uh, I know you've had some struggles lately. So, obviously we've extended the deadline to pass May 4th. But this is the uh, alpha build, or just our pre uh like beta not beta well beta or alpha we just want to like see what your progress is so if you don't have anything that's fine obviously we understand what's uh, happening with you right now you're moving it's a hard time right now so that's completely fine but if you do have something we would love to see it even if it's not that much uh the alpha is just supposed to be a basic concept of what the gameplay is it doesn't have to be perfect oh hi natalie it doesn't have to be perfect. Um, we just want to see something, if possible. But if you don't, that's also fine. We understand. But as I was saying, uh, WebGL build basically just uh, allows you to play on a browser. So it's a simple way to get us your game. You could just send us a link to it, and we could just play it without having to download it. You could also easily test it. So that's all nice. So now we'll actually get into doing stuff. Uh, the first thing I want to talk about is when you make your first playable or the alpha build you're going to give us, we want you to have a few base things in the game just because without them it doesn't really feel like a complete experience. So those things are we want a win and lose condition because without that it's not really a game. It's more of a sandbox. So if you could have a win and lose condition, that would be perfect. And also along with that, corresponding UI to let the player know of this win and lose condition. It looks like connections cutting in and out. Hopefully that doesn't stop. But um, as I was saying, uh, we want UI just to, when you win, it's like, oh yeah, you won. Or if you lose, it tells you you, la you actually lost. So we want a win and lose condition. Uh, preferably we would like a pause menu. So that way, if you're in the middle of the game and you want to leave the game, you can go back to the main menu uh, and various things like that. And lastly, we want a main menu. 
if you just jump right into the game, it doesn't feel like a complete experience. Having a main menu there gives you something to have in the front, and then it takes you to the game. So the first thing we're going to talk about today, well, I'm going to show you how to do. A lot of uh, you know how to do this already, but we're just going to make a simple main menu, just in case you forgot how. Uh, it's not that hard to actually do, so it'll be a real quick thing, a quick refresher, in case you forgot what you have to do. So we're just going to make a new scene. Uh, we'll save that. So we have our new scene here, and we're just going to make a new text. And when we make a new text, a uh, new UI, I always like to make the canvas uh, scale with screen size. That way, no matter what the screen resolution is, it'll always look the same on every computer. So, if I ooh, move over here. Oop, didn't mean to do that. Go here. Put the text here. And I changed the resolution. You'll see it remains in relatively the same spot, no matter what the resolution is. That's what scale of screen size is going to do for you. I highly recommend that you always make your canvas scale of screen size. If you make a constant screen size, sometimes it doesn't scale properly. Although in this case, it seems to... Like, you see how the sides push in, but the size of the text doesn't change. If we go back here, do scale with screen size. You'll see the actual size of the text and everything compresses with the compression of the screen as you change the resolution. So that's why you want to do scale with screen size, because every monitor is different and you want your game to look the same on every resolution. If you don't do that, sometimes text will just not even be in the scene to begin with. If you were to put a text up here and it wasn't scale with screen size, make a constant screen size. Uh, let's put this back over here. And you change this, you'll see the text gets cut off. You don't want that. So again, I'm going to do scale screen size. That way the text always stays in the same spot exactly how we want it. So now, this is just going to be, I'm just going to do a quick demo as I said. It's not going to look pretty, but I just want to show you how to make a quick menu to navigate through the different scenes we have, whether it is go to the main game or a side game, whatever you have. So this will be name of the game. Oh, <laughs> boom, that's a beautiful name for our game. So you put uh, name of the game there. Again, I did this in a previous lesson, but you could change the alignment just by clicking on this. So that way you could have everything perfectly aligned to the screen. So now this is perfectly centered. All nice. This is easy, but now we actually do a button. So that way we could actually go to the game scene. So we'll go here, UI, button. And just like the text, this button and then button text mesh pro. I personally like the Text Mesh Pro one because I like the Text Mesh Pro text better. So we'll just make a button. We'll center it right there. And as you can see, we have three different scenes here. So I'll just make three different uh, buttons that go each to each of the different games just to show you how to go to different things. So one, two, three. Call this one cabin car and cat. We don't really have official names for these yet, so I'm just gonna call them what they are in the scene names. And obviously this text isn't beautiful, but that's not the point of what we're trying to teach you today. So if you want to go to the next scene, what you want to do is you're gonna click on this plus and it's gonna ask you to insert a script here so we need to actually make a script that uh, tells unity to go to this next scene so let's do that right now I'm gonna add a component uh, go to scene and we're gonna make a new script create an add 
and it'll make a new script, add it to the button. So here's our new script, edit script, open it up. So the first thing we need to do, just like with a lot of other things, we need to import the scene management. So that way we could access the functions that that, that scene manager access the functions that scene management has. So we're using, and in order to do this, we just type in using Unity Engine dot scene management, and we're gonna make a new function. We don't need any of these start or update functions that are pre-built uh, into the script. And we're going to make a public void change scene. And it's going to take one argument, which is going to be a string. And we're going to call it scene name. OK, so what I'm doing, I made this function public because if it was not public, we cannot access it through this button component here. If it was private, it wouldn't show up. It has to be public so that the button can access it. Then we're having one argument here. And the argument is going to be the name of the scene. And then based on the name of the scene, we're going to go to that scene when we click on the button. And in order to do this, it's really simple. You just do scene management manager dot load scene. And we'll put the scene name here. And it's as simple as that. <laughs> so when you click on the button, we're going to call this function, and this will take us to the next scene. And just one thing I just want to tell you. Um, obviously, we have this argument here that's a string. You can also hard write the name by making the two quotes indicating a string, and then writing the scene name, for example, cat. So the name of the scene is cat. You can just write in low scene cat. But I'm just going to make one universal function that's going to be used for all of them. So instead of making three different functions for each different scene, we're just going to have one function and then input the name of the scene here and then load it. And to actually show you what that looks like, go to the scene. We drag the script into here and we open this up. You'll see there's a few things here. Uh, these are the different, uh, like the various functions you could call when you click on the button. But what we want to do is go to go to scene. That is our script we have here. Then it'll bring up the various functions associated with that. There's some default ones. That's why there's a bunch shown here. But we only care about the one we just made, which is change scene. And once we click on that one, you'll see this little box pop up. This box indicates the argument that we wrote here. So we're going to write the string of our, the name of the scene right here. So we're on the cabin button. Our scene name is called cabin. And just one thing to remind you guys is these scene names are case sensitive. So make sure you spell it exactly as you see it. If I wrote cabin with a lowercase c, it wouldn't work. So cabin. And we're just going to do the same thing with the other two buttons. Go to scene, put it there. Go to scene, change scene. This is car. And lastly, this one, go to scene. Here, boop, up. Uh, cat. OK. So along with this, if we try to run the game now and we click on these buttons, you'll see that they don't work. Like I click on this and it won't work, but you'll see that there's an error that comes up. It can't be loaded because it wasn't added to the build settings. So what this means is you actually have to add the scenes to the build settings in Unity. So as you can see here, I already have cat in here, but we don't have cabin or car. So that's why when I clicked on cabin, the scene wouldn't load. You, you could just drag them in as you saw me did. So you just drag them in here and you're just all good to go. So now if we do it again, it should work. Go to cabin and now we're in this scene. 
Um, okay. Uh, and I guess if you just want to see the other scenes work as well, and so on. So that's just a quick little thing I want to talk about with that, uh, in case you weren't sure how to go to the next scene from a main menu, and so on. So, moving on from that, we're just going to go back to the cat scene. Next thing I want to talk about is um, setting the cursor to like not be on the screen. So as you see now, uh, the cursor is on the screen. And this could be a bit of a hassle. Because let's say I just look up and I want to attack. I'm now clicking on the top of the window because I just have my mouse up here. So that's a problem. We don't want the mouse to be there. We just want to be able to control this freely without having to accidentally worry about clicking on something. So this is a simple fix. We're just going to go to the cat player, the script. Um, it does really matter what script we put this on. As long as the script is currently running in the scene, you're good to go. But since the animal controller is in the scene, we'll just put it on here. And it's fairly simple to get the cursor to turn off. So cursor dot visible equals false. Okay, so cursor.visible, as the name implies, we're just going to turn off the cursor. So if we go here and we run the game again, you'll see that the cursor is now gone. But, okay, yeah, as Natalie says, it doesn't matter what script you put it on, uh, but don't forget where you put it. That is it. Uh, make sure you keep that in mind because. How should I word this? I, I put it on the script on the cat. So if I go to the cabin scene, my cursor is still going to be there because I don't have the cat script in that scene. So make sure that it's always on a script that's going to be in all of your scenes. Uh, as, since this is a quick example, I just put it on the cat. But for your projects, make sure you put it on... Uh, no matter what scene you're in, there's always a script that has what I just wrote there. But... What I wanted to talk about is, you see, the cursor's gone. But if I keep my, moving my mouse up, you'll see that once it leaves the game window, the cursor will pop up again. This is still a problem, because we can still accidentally click on things. So, the next thing we need to do to make that not happen is we need to type in cursor again, dot lock state equals cursor lock mode dot locked. So what this will do is it'll lock the cursor to the center of the screen. But since we also have the cursor invisible, you won't see that it's just at the center of the screen. So the cursor is always going to be there, but it'll still be able to detect the movement of the mouse, even though the mouse technically won't be able to move. So if we run the script again, we'll run the game again. Boop, boop, boop. You see, my cursor is now gone, and I guess you can't really see my hand, but I'm constantly moving the mouse up, and you'll see no matter how much I move it up, my mouse will never show up at the top. So that's perfect, because now we can't accidentally click on things. We can play the game as freely as we want without having to worry about accidentally clicking on something, but there is one thing to remember, which is how do I, <laughs> how do I stop the game now, because my cursor is gone. It's simple. You just hit the escape key, and that'll take you out of the game window, and the cursor will pop up again, so you can click out. And if you want to go back to the game, just click on the window, and we'll we click on the game scene, and the cursor will go away again. So, that's another thing I want to talk about. Make sure in your games, if you don't need the mouse there, you shouldn't be able to see it. Obviously, if your game has stuff that requires you to use the mouse, you might not you wouldn't want to get rid of the mouse cursor because you sort of need it. But you could also make sure to... Hmm, how should I wear this? Like with David's game, he has a thing where you could bring up your phone and order food. So what David can do is he could turn the mouse cursor off, but when he brings up the phone window, he could turn the cursor back on. So we go back here. 
uh, cursor mode dot uh, none. So if you wanted to not lock the cursor again, you can make it none, and then also make sure cursor that visible is true. Uh, so what I'm trying to say with this is, in the beginning of the game, what you would want to do is you would want to lock the cursor, make it invisible. But then when you bring up your phone window, you'd want to make the cursor, cursor visible again, and then set lock mode to none, and so on. And then when you put your phone back away, I would turn off the mouse again. It's small little touches. That's not a huge deal, but it just makes the game feel better. Not having the mouse in your face constantly is just a more immersive experience as a player. So that's one thing you want to do. Um, okay, so that's that. Now we'll actually talk about building your games, because there's a few things involving building your game that I want to talk about. So if you don't know already, in order to build your game, go to Edit, Project Settings. Oh, actually, I lied. We're not building the game. I want to show you some pre-build things to do, just to make your builds look nicer. Uh, add some little touches to it. So that's in Edit, Project Settings not the actual build. So the first thing I want to talk about is up here, if you go to player window on the left side, player, there's different things you could click on. So you go to player, you'll see there's some options here. When you make a build, it's going to make the uh, game the name of whatever you have here. So if I were to make a build, my build name will be called this thing here. <laughs> so we don't want that because that's ugly. We want our build to be something nice, like the the name of our game. Uh, this game doesn't really have a name, so we'll just call it Make Room uh, Fun Project. Yeah, what a great name. Everybody wants to play this game. So now when you make a build, the name of the file will be called Make Room Fun Project instead of whatever we had there before, which is unpleasing to look at. Also, it's much more professional to have a name. Uh, you could also have a company name, but I won't get too into it because you'll almost never notice this. But if you have system files, the directory of the system files, I forget it exactly, but it's like user something 64, like 64 bit, and then games, and then it'll have your company name, then in company name, it's going to have your project name. So if you really care about the name of that file path, then you could change this. But otherwise, it doesn't really matter. So we could just leave that as that. The next thing I want to talk about is icon. When you make an application, by default, the icon will be the default Unity icon, which is ugly. <laughs> well, it's not ugly, but you want your game to be personalized, all nice and pretty. So if you click on this, I made a very terrible default logo. So well, now we have a logo. Isn't that crazy? So when you make a build, our picture for the application is going to be this instead of the default Unity icon. So as I said, it doesn't really matter, but it adds little personal touch to it. If you care about the project you make, it just makes it feel more complete of a package. Uh, the next thing I want to talk about, and probably the last thing, is the splash image. So in the beginning of your game, uh, when you build it, there's going to be, I'll show you here. If you were, if you click on preview, it would show you what it looks like. But basically, when you start your game, by default, unless you own the pro version of Unity, there's going to be a little splash screen that just says Unity. So as you see, it just says Unity there. That's fine and dandy, but if you have a logo or like your company name, you can put it right here. So I just have this. It's not the prettiest one, but gets the job done for what I'm trying to show you. We hit preview again, and now it's like, whoa, it was made by me or Make Room, the company. So if you have a little uh, logo, I know Narelle does. A little thing associated with your name you just want to like show it in the beginning of your game then put it right here 
when you first open the game, this is the first thing you see. And all nice. But, like I said, it <laughs> doesn't really matter that much. You can make the duration last longer by playing with the slider. If you want it to last for 10 seconds, it'll just be here a really long time. Or the default 2 seconds. But, that's that. Nothing too crazy. Just some fun stuff I thought you might want to know about. Because it just makes the overall project feel a, more like your... Like it's your project, you know? And you want people to know it's your project. You want people to enjoy playing your project. And all these little touches add to that experience. So, moving on from that. Because it's not incredibly too important. I just want to show you that because I like it personally. But to actually build your project, you go to File, Build Settings, and then this will pop up. Uh, one thing to note, the topmost scene you have here is going to be the scene that loads when you start the game. So if I start the game, it's going to start on the cat scene because that is the first one I have in the project. Um, since we now have a main menu, we don't want that. We want the main menu to pop up. So what we're going to do, bring the main menu into the scene, and we're going to put it at the top. That way, when you start the game, it starts at the main menu. If I were to put it down here, it would not start at the main menu. So make sure whatever scene you want to first load when you start the game, it's all the way at the top. So the next thing I want to talk about is actually building a project. So since we're going, to, since you guys are going to submit the game via WebGL, I'll talk about this one first. Then once we finish this one, I'll show you the PC, Mac, Linux builds, but we'll get to that. So, what you do, you just click on WebGL here. Um, if you don't have the package installed already, instead of seeing this th that you see here, there'll be a little button that says, I forget exactly what it says, something along the lines of, please import this package, or import, I don't know. It'll say something, just click on it, and it'll start downloading something that allows you to make a WebGL build. Um, make sure you direct that file to the current version of Unity that you're on. Because if you don't, it won't work. It'll give you an error. So as you see here, I'm running 2019.1.2. So I navigated to the folder to which I installed uh, Unity 2019.1.2 and downloaded the WebGL thing there. And just follow the instructions that it tells you. It's fairly straightforward, but it is important that you put it in the right folder which is the current version of Unity you're running. So once you do that, by default, you're probably going to be running this build. So you have to first switch the platform. OK. So yeah, David said, uh, David just told me. The little button that'll be here, it says Open Download Page. Just click on that and follow the instructions that it tells you. But in order to make a WebGL build, after you do all that, Oh, one thing I should note, when you download it, you have to make sure you close Unity, otherwise it won't work. <laughs> you have to d close Unity, then install it, then open Unity again, come back here, and then I'm going to switch platform, because right now the build is optimized for a PC Mac build. So by doing switch platform, we're going to optimize it for a WebGL build. So just give it a sec as it switches over doesn't take incredibly long but it is a waiting process so we'll just wait <laughs> okay so now that we've done this you see sometimes there's an error here most of the time it doesn't matter uh, in this case it doesn't this one always pops up for me I'm not sure why but what you want to do you simply click on the build button and it's going to ask you where you want to save the file uh, this is very important you have to make sure wherever you save your file, you put it in a folder because for WebGL specifically, it's going to give you two folders and one file. So if these two folders and one file aren't in the same place, you can't upload uh, your build onto a web page because it needs all those necessary files to actually work. So you have to make sure that you make a new folder. We'll call this make room build Oop. okay 
gonna make a new folder and then just save it here that way all the files that it needs all in one nice place and when you go to upload your game it'll work perfectly it's it's not a incredibly complex issue but sometimes you're just like huh why isn't this working and it's as simple as oh I forgot to put it in a folder <laughs> so make sure you put it in a folder and this does take a bit of time depending on how big your project is so hopefully this isn't terrible but while this just goes in the background I'll bring up this Whoa, what's this? It's Simmer.io. So this is how you're going to uh, get your games to us. If you go here, I made a little account five seconds ago. And if you click on this little upload thing, you'll see it allows you to uh, upload a WebGL build. So once this fit... Oh. Okay. <laughs> so while this downloads... Uh, all you have to do is, once it makes the build and puts it in the folder, you're just going to drag that folder into here, and it'll be beautiful. Um, if you ever need help with figuring out how to upload the game to Simmer.io, they do have this handy-dandy little video right here. Super short, 50 seconds. It'll show you how to put the WebGL build. So, if I go here, I'm pretty sure I made a backup build already. Uh, oh yeah, I did. Okay. Yeah, okay. So here's a test build I made right before class. Uh, this is, looks like it's taking a while for whatever reason. So, this build, unfortunately, does not have the main menu I just made. But, just for speeding things up and showing you how this actually works, when you make your build and it goes in this folder you're just going to drag it into here and it's going to upload and whoa my game is in a browser now isn't that crazy so here's the little splash thing i was talking about and now we're in this scene so because it was the test build we just started in the cat scene but yeah that's that <laughs> so it's like whoa I'm playing on a web page now. You can now easily share this with your friends, whoever, doesn't matter. But moving past this, uh, make sure after you actually upload it here, uh, you actually like save it and make a project out of it. And that's all down here. So you can name this whatever you want, make room. Uh, if you want to make it public, don't check this off. If you want to make it private, check this off. Um, if you want other people see it to see it, make sure it's like that. But if you don't want other people to see it and just us, then click on this. And then you just hit save upload. And you'll get this link here. So this link is what you're going to send us so that we could play your game next week. Um, this link you could either send to me or Natalie. I'll just quickly post my email down here. And Natalie, if you could send yours as well. It doesn't matter who you send it to. It'll all get to us. But you could just send your build links here to either one of our emails. And next week, we'll play your games. And honestly, don't know why this is taking so long. So you might have to just restart, make a new build. Um, but OK, let we'll us assume, oh, that went all perfect. So now, I'm going to show you how to make a PC build. So this is an actual application. Uh, this is different from what you're going to submit us next week. Oh, okay. I think this is why it wasn't working. Okay, okay. One thing I should note. After you switch your platform, uh, make sure you go to Visual Studio and reload the scripts. So that way, when you go to make your build... It's like actually gonna work. My bad, <laughs> I forgot that was a step. But now we know. So next thing we're gonna do, I'm gonna show you how to make an actual build. Well, not an actual build, uh, an application build. Uh, you don't have to send us this application build,
but it is something fun to have if you just want to have it on your desktop or you want to put it on a website such as itch.io and have other people download and play it. So again, we have to switch the platform. So this is going to take a little bit. So we're just going to wait while this works. <laughs> And this time, we're actually going to reload the scripts, so that way it makes a build. Okay, so once we have this, the steps are relatively the same. We're just going to click on build again. And I already made a folder. Make sure you make a folder. Test build 1. Put it right here. And it's just going to make your build. So. Again, while this does its thing, I'm going to bring up the next website, which is itch.io. So I know Natalie talked about this last week, but I just want to bring it up again. If you want other people to play your games, itch.io is a great place to put them. It's completely free to put your games on here. Um, it's fairly well known. As you can see, there's a ton of games here uh, that get uploaded every day. Uh, it's a good place to put your games. A lot of indie projects are put here. So, a perfect place for you. Um, what I do want to say is, how do you actually upload your game to itch.io? So I made this new account. What you do is you click on this little arrow, click on Upload New Project, and you'll see various things here. Um, if you want people to pay for your game, you can like, set up payment I didn't do that, so that's why this little thing is here. But if you want to do that, go right ahead. But you just make the title of your game here. You could upload a cover image, add screenshots. There's a lot of things you could do. Uh, what kind of product it is. You could also put WebGL stuff here. As you can see, if you have a zip or HTML file that could be played in the browser, this is where you put your WebGL build. Um, all these things. You can make it free, paid, or well, zero or donate. So, whatever. Or you just flat out don't want money. You do no payments. And then when you actually go to upload your project, you just click on upload files here. And then you just drag and drop the file. Um, by default, they don't want you. Okay. Okay. <laughs> okay. So, as Natalie says, if you also want to send us a actual build, like a, a build of your project instead of the WebGL thing, you can upload it here, but don't make it paid because we're not going to pay to play your game. <laughs> so don't do that. But as I was saying, uh, there is a default one gigabyte file size limit. So if your game is over one gigabyte, this could be an issue. Uh, make sure you try to compress your files with a zip, like make it a zip file. Um, otherwise, if your game goes over one gigabyte, uh, just send them an email. They get back to you pretty fast. I emailed them yesterday about a different thing I was working about on, because my game is just over a gigabyte. So, they got back to me the next day. So now I have four gigabytes. So, it's not, it's not like a big process, in case you're wondering. If your project is over a gigabyte, just email them. They'll get back to you probably the next day. And give you more space it's not a hassle but by default it's just one gigabyte then you could tag it with what genre it is and all these various things um yeah, it's pretty much that i just wanted to make sure you know about these two different websites they're both pretty helpful uh this one's pretty fast as i said if you just want a quick if you, want, you just want to quickly be able to play your game just on a browser etc all these things but we'll move on I don't know what's wrong with this <laughs> I don't know why it's not building the cat scene it's weird I wonder if it's because I forgot to hit if I never hit save but that never happened to me before so hopefully that doesn't happen with you or you can just let it wait sometimes the builds take a while but so on but that's all I wanted to talk about with uh, making your builds. Uh, 
I'll just reiterate one more time really quickly. Make sure you put your scenes here, otherwise they won't load. Make sure your main menu or whatever the first scene is, is at the top. Uh, that's pretty much it. That's it. <laughs> that's all you have to know. Oh, also when you build it, make sure you put it in a subfolder so that way all the files are nice in one place. Uh, but moving past that, I want to quickly talk about player prefs because if you're going to make an application where people could like open your project and quit your project, you probably want there to be some sort of saving. So that way the next time you open your game, you have some of your progress or whatever it is, high scores still available there. I know some of you already know how to do this, but if you don't, I think it'll be a nice little thing, a nice little refresher to talk about. And basically we're just going to talk about player prefs. So if you don't know, player prefs, simple way to do saving. It's not the like safest way to do saving in terms of if you don't want people to edit the save thing. Because technically, if you go to the, the build, you could play with the numbers in a text file. But that doesn't really matter in the scale of a project. So for stuff like this, it's perfectly fine if you do player prefs. So what you're going to do is there's a few options involving player prefs. If I hit dot, you'll see that there's a, a fair bit of things you can do. The first thing I want to talk about is when you start the game, if you want to set a player pref to begin with, you first have to check if it has the key already. And the key is basically the name of the player pref. So let's say by default, you want your score to be zero or not even zero. Let's say you just want it to be 10, like a little, a little road bump to pass the first time you play the game. So by default, player prefs are just going to be set to zero. So we don't want that. We want it to be 10 by default. So hypothetically, it would just be like, okay, I'm going to set int score 10. So now when I start the game, it's like, oh, nice. The default score is now 10. But this isn't really going to work because each time I run, each time I start the game again, it's going to reset my player pref back to 10 since I'm just setting the, the integer to 10 in start each time I play. So how do we get past this? What we have to do is we have to check to see if the key actually exists in the project. And then if it doesn't, then we're going to set the score to 10. But if we already have the key, just ignore it and just do nothing. So in order to do this, if player press dot has key score equal to false. Okay, so by doing this, we're just going to say, does this player pref exist? And if it does not exist, if it's false, set the score, well, the player pref score equal to 10. Otherwise, it doesn't matter. Just leave it as is. Um, okay, so that's that. Uh, but I do want to talk about actually showing this to the player. So we have this other text here. Let's bring it up real quick. We have this text. I don't think it's being used. So let's check the cat text score UI. This text. <laughs> okay, I don't think the cat has it yet. So we'll just make a new one. We'll do public text, uh, high score. So over here, we're just going to make this text here, the high score. So we're going to add it to the inspector. 
Um, there it is. High score. Go back here. And in update. Um, okay. Oh, this should be lowercase. <laughs> Sorry about that. So, in update, what it's going to do, high score, stop text, equal to the player press dot get integer, and we call this one score. Oh, and write high score. Oh, equals. Okay. Sorry about that. Okay. So, just like any other regular integer you do, you can just add it to a text. So, player press are no different. This is effectively the exact same as an integer value. It just has this fancy name, player press, in front of it because it serves as a saving system and etc. So you could just write the value that this has to the text by just writing play press that get in score. So if I start the game, by default, since we don't have this created already, it's going to be equal to 10. So if I just run the game, you'll see that it'll say high score 10. Oh, or not. Oh, okay. Because I changed the name of the text earlier, it got reset. Yeah, see, it's not there. So put it back here, and now play. And now it'll say 10, hopefully. OK, so as you see, it says high score is 10. So that's all fine and dandy. But how do we actually add to this? So if we go to down here, we have a score variable. And basically, as you play the game, in this situation, each time you hit something, the score goes up. So we're just going to compare this score with the high score. And if this score is higher than the high score, we're going to set the high score equal to this score, if that makes sense. So, so up here, before we, oh, where's update? OK, so before we display the text, we're going to run an if statement. If score is greater than. And again, this is exactly the same as a plain old integer. So it works the same in comparison values. So you could compare integers with playerpress.getInt because it's effectively the same thing. They're both the same type. They're both integers. So if this score is greater than the current high score, we are going to set int equal to score. So by default, it's 10. So if my score goes to 11, we're going to overwrite the save integer for score and set it equal to 11. And it'll save it. So that way, the next time we run the game, it'll also be it'll be 11 again. So let's quickly do that here. Run the game. So as you can see, the high score is currently 10 because our current score is 0, which is less than 10. As I hit stuff, my score will go up, but the high score will remain the same because the score is currently lower than the high score. So if we just hit this a few more times, oh god. <laughs> OK. So now it's the same, still 10. We hit this. Now the high score is 14 because our score is 14. So because the score is now higher than the high score, we're going to set the high score equal to 14. And it'll continue to do that as we progressively do things. So now it's 16, and so on. And if I stop the game and restart the game, you'll see that the high score is still 16 because it saved it in the player press. So that's always going to be 16 as long as it is lower, I mean higher, than our current score. So that's my little brief rant 
on player prefs. I thought it would be something... I know some of you know about them already, but if you don't, they're very helpful. Um, it adds longevity to your game, because as you come back, you can have something to build upon. Because, like, if there wasn't a high score there, this could just be like, oh no, I'm just hitting this. And whatever. Like, yeah, okay, it's fun to hit these pots around. That's cool and all. Oh, okay. Okay, there we go. Yeah, that's cool and all, but like, what am I working towards, you know? And that's that goes along with the win and lose condition. Um, this isn't necessarily a win-lose condition, but it does add some sort of reason to play the game, which is to beat your past high score. Which I guess could say be your win condition, which would be beat your previous best score. Um, so... Try to add player press where you can, if possible, because they're just nice to have. Um, it's nice to come back to a game and be like, oh, something I did is still here, and etc. So that's pretty much all I want to say about that. But what I will also say is there are a few other ones. It's not just integers, in case you were curious. There are uh, floats, integers, and strings. Uh, you will notice there are no characters, no char, um, so keep that in mind. If you want to do a char, you have to make it a string and then convert the string to a char by just having a single, like, a single character string, in case you ever were curious. So that's that. Um, That's pretty much all I want to talk about for today. So if you do have any questions or anything you wanted to talk about for the next time, uh, please let uh, please let me know. Uh, I'll make sure to bring it up next time. Uh, next lesson, I do have some fairly complex things to talk about, which is why I'm not going to do it now because it's about 40 more minutes, <laughs> which is way longer <laughs> than the eight minutes we have left in class. I think it'll be a lot better to dedicate a whole lesson to it instead of rushing it out now in the bit of time we have left but as i said may 4th is the project to do both of our emails are in the chat both me and natalie just send the links to your projects to us it doesn't matter if it's webgl or a build as long as it's a link we could click on and download the project or simply play the game that's fine uh make sure there's something nicer to look at make sure there's a main menu some way to navigate to the game from a different scene because that just makes the game feel whole preferably add a pause menu because pause menus are nice the way to program that is exactly the same as the main menu it's just buttons. Actually, one last thing I think we should talk about. I just remembered it. This is also super duper quick. Is this isn't that important with a WebGL build, but if you do make a regular build where it's an application you could bring up, you should have a quit button. So that way you could actually leave your game. <laughs> See, a lot of people, even I forgot about it just now, a lot of people forget about the quit button. Having to hit Control Alt Delete to terminate your uh, program, not not a great idea. <laughs> it's nice to have a quit button, but how do you actually go about programming that? Um, it's super simple. It's actually one line of code. <laughs> well, I guess more if you include making a new function. But we're gonna make a function. We'll just call it quit. And in order to quit, you type in application.quit. Whoa, could you believe it? It's that simple. So <laughs> that's literally all you do. So you just call this function, and then it'll quit out of the project, and it'll be beautiful. So you go here, and just like we did with change scene, we're just going to click on this, go to scene, quit. And now when I click on the quit button, it will quit the project. 
unfortunately, I cannot show you how that works because it does not do anything in the Unity editor because this is not an application. This is a <laughs> just an editor run simulation thing. So there's no application to actually quit out of. Unity. Okay, yeah, you, you can do uh, what Natalie said, but it, it's like the same as doing this, but that's like a safer way to do it technically, because it'll only run it if it's in the editor. I mean, if it's not in the editor. So that's a more fancy, technically better way of doing it. So try doing that one <laughs> that way. Uh, she has the code right in the chat. But as you can see, nothing happens. This isn't an application. This is just in the editor. Um, but if I actually had a build and I were to quit, click the quit button, oop, and I were to click on the quit button, it would just close the project. So nothing too crazy. I don't really have to demo it either because it just quits it. So in case you're curious, application.quit, beautiful, simple line of code. Just terminates the program. Um, yes, that's pretty much it. As I said already, um, your projects are due next Monday. Unit, uh, Natalie be, will be playing them. So make sure you have, at the bare minimum, if you can't have all these things. I mentioned four things. Uh, the pause menu, the cursor options, and the main menu. Uh, at a, and also win-lose condition. Out of those four, win-lose conditions are the most important I guess technically at f okay David said at 4 p.m. I guess technically yeah but preferably no because we would like to actually test it beforehand to make sure they work but if you're working hard up until 4 p.m. I guess so try not to do that though because <laughs> things always happen when you make builds as you saw earlier making this build took a long time that I had to close it out because I didn't feel like waiting. Uh, so get it, preferably get it done beforehand. But if not, yeah, 3 p.m. Okay, that's better. It gives you some time to actually test your build. So, okay, let's say Monday at 3 p.m. is the deadline. Anything past that, not great. <laughs> because you're cutting it close. We don't like that. <laughs> But as I was saying, the most important thing is a win and lose condition. Because without a win and lose condition, your game isn't really a game. It's just a sandbox. Um, I know a lot of your projects have been coming along very nicely so far. I'm very impressed with all of them. Uh, they, they look great, actually. <laughs> I really like all of them. But make sure there's a win and lose condition. Because otherwise, it's just a sandbox. Uh, we can't really get a feel of what your game wants to be if it's just a sandbox because like what am I working towards so that's that's the main thing you want to consider like what is the player working towards what do they want to do what is the purpose of the game so you want there to be a way to win and a way to lose because without a way to lose there's no challenge and it's not as fun if there's no challenge um, but yeah the cursor options very nice uh, they were very simple two lines of code I'll bring them up one more time uh, right here please do this makes your game look great uh, the cursor is ugly to look at just having it sitting on the screen so I would uh yes yeah, like I said just <laughs> please turn it off very simple it'll take you five seconds that's that but I've been rambling for way too long uh, See you guys next week, uh, and I look forward to seeing your projects on Monday. As I said, I'm really happy with how they're coming out. They look great. Uh, I want to see all the work you put in for the next week. So thank you for listening, and see you guys next week.